Okay, so now we'll be moving on to activity networks. So activity networks are usually when you have some form of project and there's a lot of different tasks or activities involved in completion in order to complete the project. But the thing is when we're doing a really large project, certain activities or certain tasks need to be done before you can commence a different task. And that's what a predecessor is called in an activity network. So for example, if we're starting at this point and we're ending at this point, the first activities that we need to do are activity A and activity B. And then before we can start activity C, we need to have done activity B. So this is how we sort of read that activity network. And the, and the numbers next to the A show the approximate um, sort of time that it's going to take to do those activities. So if activity A is going to take two minutes or two hours, depending on the question, activity B is going to take four hours. So if we were to draw, so this, um, so this is called the precedence table. So in order to write up the precedence table, all we need to do is write down all the activities in the project and then just write the immediate predecessors. So the immediate predecessors are just the activities that must be done immediately before. So for example, for activity D, the immediate predecessor is activity A. So the activity that must be done immediately before it and so on. So here is um, the um, immediate predecessors and also the time. So this is the precedence table. But a problem that you will shortly know um, when you write up the precedence table is the fact that some activities, for example here, might have the same, um, might have one of the same predecessors but not all immediate predecessors are the same. So for example activity D has an immediate predecessor of activity B. But activity E has immediate predecessors activity B and activity C. So that's a little bit of a problem because when we're drawing the activity network, when we're drawing up activity E, if we draw the line going from activity B all the way to activity E, and then we draw activity D as well, that will show that activity C and activity B are the immediate predecessors of activity B. But that's not really the case, it's only activity B. So we draw a dummy activity. So a dummy activity is where multiple activities share one but not all immediate predecessors. And by drawing up that dummy activity, essentially what we're doing is, um, so if we draw a dummy activity here, essentially what, that, what we're showing is activity D has an immediate predecessor of activity B. But activity E has an immediate predecessor of activity C and also activity D um, and also activity B. So that's what it's used to sort of show. Activity, uh, dummy activities have um, a time of zero. They don't take any time. It's just there to sort of make sure the activity network is correct. Okay, so some quick definitions before we go on to critical path analysis. So a critical path is essentially the path through a network that takes the longest amount of time. Um, and all other activities sort of work around it. And then we have um, earlier starting time and later starting time. So the earlier starting time for any activity is the earliest time at which that activity can be started. And then the latest time is essentially the latest time that an activity can be started without affecting the critical path. So the goal of critical analysis is not to affect the critical path, because if we affect the critical path, then we are essentially going to increase the amount of time that it takes to finish off the activity. Um, the project, sorry, not the activity, the project. And the float slash slack time is just the amount of time that a particular activity can be postponed without affecting the critical path. And the way that we find the float or slack time is essentially by subtracting the earlier starting time from the latest starting time. Okay, so now we'll have a look at doing forward scanning. So forward scanning is a really important skill when we're doing critical analysis. And the way that we do forward scanning is essentially just finding the earliest starting time for each activity. So for example, activity A, it can be the earliest starting time is zero. So it can be started at any time. However, activity C must be started after eight hours or after eight minutes because activity A must be started before starting activity C. So that's why the earliest starting time for activity C is eight. 
And then for activity E, it is 9. Because activity A and activity C must be done before starting activity E. Similarly for activity, okay, so then we'll move on to this path. So for this path, the minimum start, the early starting time for activity B is zero because it can be started at any time because we don't have any immediate predecessors. Activity D, however, must be started after six hours because it needs to, um, because activity B must have been completed before starting activity D. Activity F is a little bit weird. Both activity A, activity C, activity B, and activity D need to have been completed before starting activity F. However, if activity A and activity C take nine hours to complete, and activity B and activity D take eight hours to complete, this is sort of like the critical path. So activities A and activity C must have been done before starting activity F because these take eight hours, whereas these activities take nine hours. So the minimum starting time or the earliest starting time is, a, is nine hours. And then for activity G, so if we look at activity G, if we look through this path, it's um, activity A, C and E must be done before starting G. But if we look at this path, activity A, activity C, activity um, F must be done. So which one's the longest? So activity H, A, C, and E is, um, what is that? That's 12 hours, where activity A, activity C, and activity F is nine hour, um, is 10 hours only. So therefore the early starting time is 12 hours. And then H is just going to be 14 hours because activity G, which is two hours, must be completed before start, starting activity H. And then essentially we find the mid earliest starting time. So 15 hours, is the time that's going to take the, to complete the project. So next step is to do backward scanning. So backward scanning is just the, um, the exact opposite. So we start from the finish line or the finish of the project, and then we move. So essentially we find the latest starting time that it can start. So 15 hours, so 14 hours. So it needs to be started um, 14 hours. Um, so it needs to be started after 14 hours, uh, and that's the latest starting time. However, activity G, so we subtract two, 12 hours, activity E, so you go backwards like this. So this would be nine, because 12 hours minus three, which is nine. And activity F would be 12 minus one, which is 11. So see how it's a little bit different, the numbers, because here we were going like this, and here we're just going like this. So 12 minus 1 is 11. And then F minus D is, so 11 minus 2 is 9. And then 2 minus 3, uh, 6 is, sorry, not, so 9 minus 3 is, uh, 9 minus 6 is 3. Um, so, that, so those are the latest starting times for this path. So if we look at this path, however, we have um, nine minus one, which is eight. So if, so for example, for C, we have two parts going in. So we have E and we also have F. So out of F and or C, you choose the one which has the lowest latest starting time. So since E has the lowest latest starting time, you will use this to work out the latest starting time for activity C. It's just a little bit of um, a problem that some students might get into. Um, okay, so therefore this will be eight, and then if we subtract eight, it will be zero. So that's essentially um, cr uh, critical path analysis. And then the actual critical path is the one in which the latest starting time and the earliest starting time are the same. Essentially the path where we have no um, float time. Whereas all of these are going to have float time. So these activities are not critical. Whereas all of these activities are critical. Okay, and now we move on to crashing. So crashing is just involving the chain. Um, so sometimes we might need to change the conditions of the activity in order to reduce the completion time. So this might include reducing the individual times it might take to complete activities on the critical path or sometimes it might be changing the activity times of different activities and therefore that's sort of changing the entire sort of critical path. 
So um, there's a lot of trial and error and you will, uh, and this is best done by doing a lot of practice questions. Um, and then another thing that you will be having a look at um, is crashing with cost. So crashing with cost is sometimes when a certain cost is associated with crashing a particular activity. So crashing essentially just reducing the time that it takes to um, for an activity to sort of occur or the time it takes for it to complete an activity. So if activity D, for example, takes $150 per hour to reduce and activity E takes $180 per hour to reduce and they're both on the critical path, it will be much more beneficial to reduce the cost of activity D um, because that only costs $150. So her, so that's just crashing. So crashing with cost is just when you reduce the time, but, the, but there's a certain cost associated. Okay.